Hello, I'm Noelle Lim on ASEAN Speaks, a podcast by Maybank Investment Banking Group. Our research teams do a deep dive on how last week's market volatility will affect ASEAN stocks and also discuss India's budget and if it's time for profit-taking in the markets. Chua Hak Bin, our regional co-head of macro research, confers with the analysts. To recap on markets last week, it was a pretty wild week as markets had to digest the big tech earnings from uh, Facebook, Meta and Amazon. Uh, more hawkish central banks, and geopolitical developments. The U.S. employment data surprised with the economy adding 467,000 jobs in January, despite the Omicron surge, and markets were only anticipating about 150,000. The unemployment rate, however, climbed slightly to 4% in Jan, from 3.9% in the previous month, despite the strong job gains. U.S. government bonds sold off sharply after the job market report, with the 10-year yield now jumping to 1.92%. That's the highest level since the start of the pandemic. Uh, strong job numbers will bolster the Fed's resolve to tighten monetary policy and hike at a March meeting. Traders are now giving even chance that the Fed might hike by 50 basis points instead of a 25 basis point. Asian markets were mostly higher, with the Asia-Pacific index rising 2.8% for the week, led by Hong Kong, Japan, and Singapore. China markets were close for the week. Uh, but the open markets tumbled on interest rate jitters. The ECB has turned more hawkish, and markets are now expecting the ECB to lift its primary deposit rate by year-end. The euro area inflation rate likely climbed to 5.1% in January. That would be the highest since record keeping started in 1997. The Germany uh, five year bond yield turned positive for the first time in four years. Uh, the UK FTSE markets also ended lower for the week as the Bank of England hiked rates by 25 basis points, with four out of the nine members actually voting for a 50 basis point rate hike. Uh, UK inflation rate rose to 5.4% in December, and that's the highest in 30 years. We will have Andy later to share his views on the ECB and Bank of England. The US markets were on a roller coaster ride last week, but eventually ended the week higher. Uh, Meta, or Facebook's big sell off, was offset by Amazon's price rally after the earnings beat. In the energy markets, all prices surged to a seven year high on Friday to over $93, the seventh straight weekly increase. Worries are intensifying about supply disruptions fueled by adverse US weather conditions and elevated US Russia tensions over Ukraine. The gold rose on safe haven demand despite a strong US dollar. Now this week, we'll be watching out for the US CPI, which comes out on Thursday. So any upside surprise could rock markets. Uh, China, Taiwan uh, markets will also, and Vietnam will also open after the long uh, Chinese New Year and Tet holiday. Uh, China markets should play catch up and open higher. Uh, notable macro increases uh, this week include uh, China's Kaizen Services PMI, Taiwan trade data, 4Q GDP data from uh, Malaysia and Niger. Uh, there are also central bank meetings in Thailand, Niger and India. Uh, we're expecting Bank of Thailand and Bank of Asia to stay on hold at this week's meetings. Uh, among notable Asian companies reporting earnings are Alibaba, Nissan, SoftBank, Honda, Toyota, and Yam China. US companies reporting this week include Pfizer, Walt Disney, Coca Cola, Twitter, and Under Armour. So today we have a uh, duet on inflation in Asia and Thailand, which is also creeping higher. Andy on the ECB, Bank of England, and Reserve Bank of Australia's policy direction. Anand on his latest ASEAN strategy. Jean on the Singapore tech names after tracking a yeah, lower following the U.S. tech sell-off, Desmond on Malaysia's loan growth and the bank's outlook, Yuvani on her downgrade of the Thai tourism sector, and lastly, Jiga on the India budget. So let's kick off first with um, Jue. Uh, looks like inflation is also rising across ASEAN, with both Indonesia and Thailand reporting high inflation for January last week. So for Indonesia, what's the inflation outlook and Bank Indonesia's probable policy response? Hi, morning, everyone. Uh, so Indonesia's headline inflation... Uh, climb back to uh, Bank Indonesia's target range of 2 to 4% in January. Uh, the data print was at 2.2%. That's the fastest pace since May 2020, mainly on the back of higher food and energy costs. Uh, core inflation also picked up to 1.8% uh, as prices for discretionary items mostly rose, uh, including personal care and other services, clothing and footwear, and recreation, sports, and culture uh, as domestic demand improved. Uh, we do expect inflation to continue aging up in the coming months, uh, but stay within BI's target range of 2 to 4% uh, on the back of improving demand, uh, elevated commodity prices, and also the 1% VAT hike, which will kick in uh, starting 1st of April. Uh, for BI's policy meeting this week, we expect them to hold, uh, but we are penciling in uh, the first rate hike in the second quarter following the US Fed's uh, first interest rate hike. Uh, note that uh, in the last policy meeting, BI announced that it will be raising the reserve requirement ratio 
uh, for banks starting 1st of March to 5% from the current 3.5%. Uh, so that would be the first move towards uh, tightening. So what about Thailand? How is inflation behaving this year? Usually Thailand's inflation is quite low um, and uh, BOT is likely response. Yep. So for Thailand as well, uh, headline inflation jumped to 3.2% in January, uh, despite the weak growth recovery. Uh, and that's the first time it uh, uh, breached the upper end of BOT's target range since April 2021. Uh, this was mainly on the back of supply-side disruptions. Uh, food prices in particular were driven by pork costs, which uh, faced supply shortages due to the outbreak of African swine fever. Uh, prices of chicken and eggs also rose as more uh, consumers switched to poultry. Uh, and cooking oil prices stayed high due to rising palm oil prices. Uh, energy costs also picked up with fuel uh, surging at double-digit pace of 28%. Uh, for Thailand, uh, inflation may hover close to 4% in February and March uh, because of low base effects, uh, but will ease back to BOT's target range by the second half of the year. Uh, the government did recently address concerns on rising food prices, uh, stating that uh, the cost of pork, chicken and eggs are poised to drop after the end of the Chinese New Year festivities. Uh, we are maintaining our average headline CPI at 2.4% this year. Uh, BOT is also meeting this week. We are looking at them to keep its policy rate unchanged, but we are penciling in a 25 bips hike in the second half of the year. Uh, as global and regional central banks uh, start to tighten monetary policy, we think BOT will likely be pressured to follow given its weak external balance as compared to pre-pandemic times. Uh, our current account balance, for instance, is expected to stay in a small deficit of around 0.5% of GDP this year. Okay, thanks, Jay. Let's move on to Andy. Oh, so and Andy, I think good call on the euro last week and thinking that the seller was overdone. So can you highlight the latest message and policy shift from the ECB, which led to the euro strength? Uh, do you think this will continue for the rest of the year? I mean, uh, morning. Um, so the key messages out of the ECB meeting, I think, uh, that saw the euro strengthen and the uh, bond yields actually high, I think includes a few things. First is um, uh, ECB's Lagarde, I think, noted there was unanimous concern around the table of the, uh, of the governing council about inflation numbers and that risk to inflation are tilted to the upside. Uh, second, the term transitory inflation was not mentioned in the sort of uh, uh, press uh, sort of uh, briefing. The governing council thirdly also agreed that it is sensible not to exclude a rate hike this year uh, as opposed to previously ruling out a rate hike this year. So I think markets reacted, uh, moved in to bring forward expectations of a 10 basis hike to July from September and about 50 basis points uh, tightening by end uh, 2022. So uh, euro actually uh, uh, strengthened on that point. Uh. So um, we highlighted a few days before the ECB meeting that there are signs that the sell-off may, be, may find a bottom and also caution in our outlook also about that. So um, the EC, in our view, I think the euro, um, typically uh, the 9% decline since May 2020 may be coming to an end uh, unless ECB brushes off what it last said and retains its uh, dovish stance. But there are other near-term risks to watch such as the US-Russia uh, tensions over Ukraine, the French elections, and of course the uh, FOMC side of things. So our view in sum, we expect Euro to be in a bottoming process, uh, trade within the 110 to 115 range for the first half 2022, uh, taking into consideration the Fed's uh, normalization of French election risk, but we do not expect uh, political driven weakness to persist. Lah. So by end second half of this year, we expect Euro to turn a bit higher towards the 115 to 120 uh, range as dollar strength sort of gives way. Uh, Habib. Can you also share the highlights from the other central bank meetings, uh, the Bank of England and Reserve Bank of Australia? It looks like uh, you know, there is uh, a shift towards a more hawkish uh, policy direction. Yeah, so a bit of a two extremes there. Uh, one, uh, for BOE, the tightening cycle is well underway with, uh, <laughs> I think, first hike of about 15 basis points uh, in December last year and another 25 basis points hike at the February MPC. So a very tight labor market, more persistent, uh, persistent price pressures were the push factors for BOE to act. I think the last MPC saw the potential for BOE to quicken its uh, pace of tightening going forward. I think five members voted for 25 basis points hike. Four members uh, who dissented actually voted for 50 basis points hike. So it looks like it's definitely hawkish. Uh, QE will also begin to unwind. I think the actions exhibit greater sense of urgency, a risk of faster pace of normalization. And, and BOE also anticipates CPI to rise higher. Uh, so markets are pricing in much, uh, as much as another 120, 120 basis points hike 
up to November 2022 with the next hike coming as soon as the next MPC in March. So basically the scenario for BOE on the on Sterling side would be front-loading rate hikes is a risk, a major key risk to watch out of the BOE. On the RBA side, uh, something to take note of, which is also at the other extreme, it ended its bond purchase program in first Feb, but the cash rate unchanged at 0.1%. Technically, RBA have tightened uh, quantitatively, but the issue of um, uh, the, the cash rate or policy rate has not moved. Essentially, the governor actually is slightly shifted uh, towards um, uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more uh, hawkish slightly. So in the end, our view is that there's a risk of a rate hike in May 2022 instead of the more widely held view of August. Uh, should there be more upside surprises in the upcoming wage and uh, CPI data, which could lead to greater buoyancy or support for the Aussie in our view. And altogether, uh, uh, it, that gives you another extreme uh, on the RBA side, uh, Habib. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, let's bring in Anand. So Anand has been a volatile, crazy start to the year with prospects for a more aggressive Fed hike uh, cycle and a massive tech sell-off. So how are ASEAN markets doing in the midst of all this volatility and tech sell off so far? Which ASEAN markets and sectors are outperforming? Morning, Hakben, and morning, everyone. Yeah, you're right. It's been a very volatile start to the year, at least for global markets. Uh, closer to home in ASEAN, uh, the performance has been a lot more uh, resilient. I mean, if you look at the causes for the global volatility, it's down to two things, uh, two interrelated things. Uh, basically, interest rates hitting up a lot faster than people expected, or monetary tightening happening a lot faster. And the related issue of you know, uh, tech valuations coming off due to that increase in uh, interest rates. So the good news for ASEAN is, A, we don't have that many tech stocks in the first place. So it hasn't really impacted the markets very much, especially the benchmark indices, which are very value oriented. Uh, and second, most central banks in ASEAN have signaled a relatively moderate rate hike pathway. I think uh, most recently, you know, Malaysia Central Bank, uh, Bank Negara reiterated that you know, they're not looking at aggressive rate hike like what is being expected of uh, the Federal Reserve uh, this year. So I think that's been a, a bit of a buffer for ASEAN stocks. So if you look at the last two weeks, you know, ASEAN indices have been relatively flat or even slightly higher uh, on, on the continued reopening thematic, uh, even as uh, global stocks have been very volatile and uh, downward biased. So for your latest um, ASEAN strategy update, or what are the key highlights and themes and any key changes to your top stock or sector picks? Yeah, sure. So if you look at the year-to-date performance, you know, a, a value market like Singapore has been the top performer. And uh, that to us uh, is unsurprising. I think if you read Tillon's uh, strategy, he's been very bullish on Singapore and, uh, and the value trade there. Uh, and of course, with the sell-off in tech and some of the tech names uh, like Gene will talk about in a second, have seen some selling. There is this, this switch into more cyclical value-based uh, stocks. And ASEAN is full of those, and Singapore particularly so. So Singapore remains one of the markets where we get a lot of client interests, uh, and I think valuations are also very digestible. So things like the banks there, uh, some of the consumer plays, uh, as well as, um, as Gene will mention, some of the tech plays now uh, look very interesting to us. Uh, in other markets, we are also seeing more upgrades and downgrades in the cyclical space. So in Malaysia, we've upgraded a few of the REITs, despite you know, tightening rates, as I mentioned. We're only looking at 25 basis points increase in Bank Negara rates this year. REITs are yielding 5 to 6% compared to the risk-free rate of sub 2%. So there's still a lot of value we see in that sector. And we've raised uh, names like KLC, CPS, uh, Pavilion, and Sunway to, to buy. Uh, in Thailand as well, we've raised the healthcare sector, which is uh, also uh, viewed as uh, containing a lot of value at this point. Uh, one thing we've done on the negative side is we've downgraded Thai tourism. Uh, that sector has run quite hard, uh, and uh, our analyst view is that it's a bit overdone right now, uh, and they should start switching up. Thanks, Anand. Bring in Gene, Singapore Tech. So I think um, you know the sell-off in the U.S. tech has also um, spread to some of the Singapore tech names. Uh, they've not been spared. So do you see the selling as overdone? Is it a good buying opportunity before the earnings results? Hi, morning, Harpin. So we think the short term, you know, a lot of the stocks look uh, rather oversold and as such, I wouldn't uh, rule out a, a technical rebound. 
Um, and while it's difficult to rob further volatility, I just like to mention that some of the stocks that we are covering now um, are trading at valuations reminiscent of early cycle uh, PEs, such as UMS and Franken. So they're trading around 10 odd times uh, PE on FY22. Um, Aztec is trading below 10 times, and typically uh, that's associated with down cycle uh, PEs. As a simple generalization, um, Singapore tech stocks tend to trade around uh, mid to slightly high teens uh, PE uh, at the peak of the cycle. And as such, we see that the current valuations are very undemanding, um, especially on the back of robust growth fundamentals. So I would think that uh, stocks in our coverage, you know, generally fit the bill that in an envir uh, inflationary environment, um, you sort of want good earnings growth to outpace uh, inflation, um, yet at a, at, at with um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, with, with undemanding valuations as well. So Jay, what kind of metrics on news flow would you be looking out for you know, to assess the tech outlook? And um, are Singapore tech names sensitive to rising interest rates historically? Okay, so I'll take the second question first. So as a knee-jerk reaction, I would say that yes, uh, Singapore tech stocks are sensitive to rising interest rates, especially if um, the, that rate of change has been rather steep. So uh, we have seen a similar sort of sell-down uh, last year in March when uh, the 10-year yields uh, spiked back then. Um, and... But that, when we reference to that period, um, as with many periods in the past, uh, the these stocks eventually uh, recovered and, and they moved on to new highs, uh, of course, uh, on the back of improving outlook. So, um, but to put it in a different way, I think if we sort of spread it over a longer horizon, uh, we've noticed that Singapore's uh, tech stocks tend to correlate better with uh, consensus EPS revisions. And so that uh, uh, gels into your first question, which is then, uh, what we will be focusing on really would be on uh, the the not just the the top down um, uh, drivers where right now we are seeing actually a demand uh, outlook being rather robust, uh, but also from a bottom up uh, perspective as well. You know which companies uh, face uh, less uh, uh, or minimize risk from supply chain issues uh, versus those that face more risks. Um, because all of this ultimately paved towards, you know, uh, uh, their, whether they have the capacity to deliver uh, the earnings surprises um, that will also eventually pave the way for uh, con positive consensus uh, revisions uh, in EPS. Just a quick last one. What are your topics in the Singapore tech space? At this juncture, we like AM the best. Uh, we, we think they're a beneficiary um, uh, at some point over the next two years of uh, Intel's uh, a massive capacity spend in Penang over the uh, next uh, 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 10 years. Uh, but in the more immediate term, uh, we see them being sort of very early in, in the cycle uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, a new sort of new generation of uh, uh, equipment that they're uh, manufacturing for, for uh, Intel. Intel has also uh, increased their CAPEX um, expectations a lot uh, for FY22 uh, as compared to uh, FY21. So uh, we, we like AM the most uh, based on these factors. We also like UMS. Um, we, we think that uh, uh, they have capacity to, uh, in, in a sort of, Everyone is sort of focusing that, you know, maybe we're approaching the peak of uh, uh, wafer fab equipment spending this year. Uh, but, you know, what we're uh, looking at is that perhaps UMS, uh, even Franken, um, has uh, potential to see strength uh, either rather into this year or even into uh, uh, next year possibly as well. So we like these uh, uh, three names uh, as our top pick. Top picks. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Desmond. So I think loan growth in Malaysia was slightly ahead of your expectations for last year. So what's driving the loan growth and what are you forecasting for this year and the key drivers? Morning. Yes. So loan growth in 2021 came in at 4.5% versus our full year forecast of 3.8%. In fact, up to October last year, loan growth was trailing expectations at just 3.3%. And it was only in November and December that growth started to accelerate due to pent-up demand following the re reopening of the economy. So the variance to our focus was primarily from stronger corporate loans demand, which jumped in the final two months. So positively, working capital loan applications have improved and that should sustain momentum into this year. As such, for 2022, we are looking at faster loan growth of 4.9% amid faster economic growth, led by expectations of faster household loan growth of 4.7% versus 4.3% in 2021 and non-household loan growth of 5.1% versus 4.9% last year. As the Malaysian bank stock seems to be underperforming the rest of the region. Um, you know, I think look at Singapore banks, Indo banks, and even Thai 
banks have been uh, have been rallying. So I just wonder what's causing this underperformance, and do you think Malaysian banks could catch up, um, or will they continue to underperform for the rest of the year? Well, the operating environment has been tough for Malaysian banks. They have had to deal with. Um, firstly, a second blanket loan moratorium under the Pumuli scheme, as well as extended financial assistance to the B50 group under the URUS program. Moreover, just as it seemed that interest in banking stocks uh, was returning, Chukai Makmo was announced, which will dampen banks' earnings in financial year 2022, actually. However, looking beyond the fact that Chukai Makmo is expected to be a one-off event, the recovery of the economy should contribute to lower provisions, while margins could improve if uh, interest rates start to rise. As such, yeah, we do think that Malaysian banks could catch up with their regional peers this year. Great, thanks, Desmond. Uh, Yuwani, so the Thai tourism plays have done pretty well since the start of the year. Uh, they've outperformed the SET index, and you've decided to downgrade the whole tourism sector. So what are the reasons for the sector downgrade? Good morning. The sector downgrade is based on the high valuations as we still expect heavy losses for all this year except Centel. We think the potential recovery of the tourism is within expectation and this is why we keep all the target prices. Uh, but we downgrade the sector because there are still challenges. Uh, despite the potential recovery, which are first the Omicron in the first quarter of this year, and secondly, rising food costs, which could affect the restaurant business. Uh, that could be bad for both Centel and Minge. We note that the pork prices have risen by as much as 35% year on year, and palm oil prices uh, by 43% year on year. So, Yuani, you are however keeping your Thai airport AOT uh, as a buy. I guess that's the only buy in your whole sector. So, why not uh, downgrade for AOT as well? Well, AOT is a buy because it's not exposed to the FNB business like our hotel operators. And so, not uh, exposed to rising food costs. It is also a prime beneficiary of the recovery being the gateway to Thailand. Valuation-wise, it is attractive with the share price now is only 64 baht, still below the peak of 80 baht uh, per share pre-COVID. Thanks, Yoni. Let's bring in Jigga. Uh, so on the India budget, can you highlight the key themes and priorities in this year's budget? Yeah, hi, thank you and good morning. Uh, so India budget uh, for uh, the presented a week ago, uh, mainly uh, tries to boost the capital expenditure. And as we have seen in the past few years, the capital expenditure by the private sector hasn't been good enough. So now uh, the pandemic has ended and some of the expenditure priorities of the government towards uh, the pandemic have been reduced and the government's focus has now turned to capital expenditure uh, through the FISC. So it's a, it's a budget uh, growth through fiscal expansion in our view. And uh, the expenditure on uh, capital uh, assets has been increased by 35.4% uh, or uh, incremental about 27 billion US dollars. The government believes that by doing this, uh, they would also nudge the private sector to do capital expenditure. The private sector in India uh, have been sitting on a lower debt equity uh, in, in a number of years. And therefore, there is a space for them to borrow more and uh, do capital expenditure. The GDP growth has been set at 8 to 8.5% 8 for this year. Um, but obviously, with the condition that uh, the pandemic is in its last phase and no more big waves will come, uh, that the supply chain issues globally would uh, reduce or subside and that uh, uh, the commodity prices would not really escalate as much as they have in the past uh, year or so. Um, amongst the key proposals for the CAPEX uh, are uh, in the areas of uh, public-private projects for road, ports, airports and logistics sector. Uh, the special allocation has been done for the solar manufacturing 
uh, and uh, also there is a proposal to raise a green sovereign bond uh, there is a lot of uh, other emphasis on sectors such as mobility uh, and renewables uh, development of special mobility zones for uh, electric vehicles uh, and promotion of clean tech in the transport sector auction of 5g spectrum waves and inviting bids for uh, developing affordable broadband in rural areas and uh, also use spare funds in the telecom uh, sector to boost optical fiber projects in the rural area uh, these are some of the key uh, highlights uh, from the budget okay and as a result just one uh, last thing to add as a result uh, we have seen immediate spurt in the bond yields uh, for the 10 year and uh, we expect i mean there's a general expectation that the uh, central bank after uh, accommodating for a very long time will change its stance and on the credit policy uh, to be held on 10th february so we better watch out there could be a surprise turn and uh... Uh, the Reserve Bank will turn more hawkish this week. So, what's your view on the India markets? Given the strong rally last year, I think some of the metrics uh, suggest that stocks are overvalued. And how are the India yeah, so, tech names holding up so far? Given the big, uh, you know, some US tech sell-off. So, the one-year forward PER is at twenty-five times, uh, which we think is unsustainable. The ten-year average is eighteen times. Our uh, target PER is twenty times, which is a slight premium to the ten-year average. But uh, we we disagree on the kind of uh, profit growth which the street is building in. So uh, our uh, Nifty target of around fourteen thousand seven hundred is uh, uh, seventeen eighteen percent below where we are today. So there is definitely going to be a general. Uh, we think that there could be a profit taking in the market. Uh, having said that the tech sector names uh, are mainly in india are like service sector and uh, their the order backlogs are at multi year high their uh, visibility of business is very very strong and uh, they are they are hiring people uh, quite uh, aggressively uh, so uh, they, they they seem to be on a very very strong wicket and uh, while they are trading at plus 2 sd Uh, to their uh, average PER, uh, we we think that uh, given the growth, uh, that that's sustainable. Okay, thanks, Jaga. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. That's all we have for today. Have a good week. For more details about what was discussed, get the research reports from our trading reps, and check out Market Insight on the Maybank Trade app. Have a good week ahead. I'm Noel Lim on ASEAN Speaks Maybank Investment Banking Group. 